everyone. Welcome to Studio Sunday. I hope you've had a great week and are staying safe. Things are starting to open up a little bit, but let's keep in mind what the scientists or doctors are saying and wear your mask and social distance. So uh, hopefully we'll get this under control in the next year to 18 months and be back to somewhat normal. Anyway, things are starting to settle in here and we're working on our schedule for the rest of the year. Diamond has reopened, which gives us all a lot of um, yeah. confidence that things will move forward with the comic book industry. Yeah. So um, we're trying to get our schedule figured out and we'll keep you abreast of our plans. Of course, there are no shows this year, but uh, that gives Terry lots of time to do more books. That's right. So, um, one thing that is lagging a bit behind is the U.S. Postal Service. I wanted to talk about that a minute. <clears throat> there are quite a few um, packages that are having difficulties getting delivered internationally. Um, what used to take six to ten days is now taking four to six weeks, which is very disconcerting to people who are waiting on them. So, we are considering putting a moratorium on international orders until things get back up and running. I think the longer packages take, the more opportunity there is for them to be lost or damaged. So we're trying to stay on top of that and we'll let you know um, what we decide on that. Because we don't want them just floating around out there somewhere in the world and people waiting on them. Right. It doesn't do anybody any good. No. So um, we'll let you know what we decide on that. Anyway, we're working on a new project that will be available for pre-order in um, probably the next week or two. It's an Art Nouveau portfolio with six gorgeous 11 by 17 signed and numbered black and white archival acid-free prints and a beautiful portfolio. Hmm. Terry has, um, he's had so many requests over the years for Art Nouveau prints, we decided this was the perfect time to make it available. Uh, he finished five years, and he's not going to start a new series um, right away. So this is a perfect opportunity for him to spend some time making these really beautiful. Some of my Art Nouveau stuff from the past. Yeah. Love doing it. So it's going to be $119 for six prints in a portfolio. And it will be limited to 600 sets. And they, just so you know up front, they will require a signature for delivery. I'm working on the shipping right now, which seems to be the, the sticking point with a lot of things right now. Um, I'm, we're probably going to ship at FedEx ground, which makes it a little more expensive, but we're sure that it will get there that way. It's about $8 more than sending it U.S. Postal Service, but we seem to have much better luck with FedEx these days than the Postal Service. So, um, and this will be a big package. I mean, Yeah, it'll be 12 by 18. So, what's all over your shirt? I think I must have spilled my tea. That's, that's nice. Sorry. That looks great. <laughs> I drool. <laughs> anyway, Terry will be posting uh, his progress on this project on uh, social media, so keep an eye out for that. He'll keep you updated as things move along. He's got most of the um, sketching completed, yeah. and he will... Um, begin the serious part of it here in the next, this coming week. Yeah. So, do you have anything to add to this, Mr. Moore? Well, the trick was, of course, to come up with the uh, uh, the figure designs, and then I come up with the, all the elaborate stuff that goes around the setting. So, I've gone, I've, we've drawn all week. We haven't, to come up we, with... trust me, we have not drawn anything. <laughs> it's a collaborative effort. I draw <laughs> and show her, and she says, you can do better. And uh, I try better, and uh, so yeah, it's 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 a process to come up with good figures that are worth doing all the elaborate design work around. So I think we're getting really really close here to the right uh, poses and the right ideas for each panel. You know, the thing about Art Nouveau is each each panel had an idea. It was like a story in a drawing, um, hashtag story in a drawing. So. It's, it's kind of fun to come up with them, you know, it's like making a piece of fine art where it, it's something you're supposed to stare at for a while and get lost in. That's fun. That's my take on it. Okay. So are you ready for the hot seat? Yeah, I am.
Okay. Be nice. <laughs> hey, don't tell me to be nice. These aren't my questions. Be nice. <laughs> the first one is from our friend Tony. Hey, Tony. And Tony asked, does Terry have any hobbies? I play guitar. And what is my other hobby? I play guitar. <laughs> <laughs> and do you collect anything? Um, no. I, I seem to have a big collection of books and art by other artists that Robin and I have amassed. Uh, other than that, no, I don't collect anything. You know, uh, Hummels? <laughs> no. Do you collect anything? <laughs> I don't. No, we don't collect anything. No, I don't collect anything, so. Um, I collect souls. So, that was an easy question. Now for the hard one. Okay. This is from Michael Whitefoot. And let me read the whole thing because it's pretty in involved. And then you can answer it, you know, however you want. Okay. Terry, you have already told us a little about your writing and page composition process on your weekly videos, but I would love to know more about it. Although the extent to which you apparently successfully compose the pages and write on the artboard itself without apparently even a finalized script or thumbnails will probably always be a mystery to me, would you nevertheless be so kind as to perhaps take us through the creation of one of your monthly books in a little more detail than you did in one of your previous videos so that we can learn a little more about how you do it. I'd be fascinated to learn, for instance, to what extent you have notes or at least bits of script written down, if at all, or which ideas you were at least crystallized in your head before commencing drawing, and to what extent these things evolved on the page. Would you therefore be so kind as to perhaps put either the artwork from one of your monthly books or else perhaps one of the printed books themselves onto your drawing table and then talk to us through its creation or talk to us through the creation of its um, the blah, 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 <laughs> and then talk us through its creation in these sorts of terms, a page at a time. Wow. And if you had any of the relevant script or notes or script, uh, sketches, etc., that would make beforehand or along the way that relate to that issue that you could show us along the way as you talk us through the creation of the book. Then I'd be fascinated to learn more about your creative process in this regard, as I am sure that many others would be interested in too. And he goes on to say that um, most people have a serious script, then they, then they do character sketches, then they do thumbnails before they even sit down to put pen, pencil to paper. Mm -hmm. And you seem to sit down and put pencil to paper and then think about all those other things. I seem to do that. <laughs> and then as I, as I read this through again, I'm wondering if he thinks you're the actual artist. <laughs> Maybe you're the front man. Oh, Maybe yeah. I'm the artist. He's, do you know, there's the, the totally prepared way, uh, the, the, you know, the, uh, the teamwork way, script, finish script, finish thumbnails, finish character design, execute the plan. Um, and then, which is kind of the DC way of working, DC Comics. And then there was the Marvel way of the old days where uh, you just kind of had an outline for a story and then let an artist draw it. And then you bring in a writer and he writes to whatever the artist ended up drawing. Uh, Mike Diodato Studios was famous for being able to work that way in the old system. Uh, I don't know if anybody really does that anymore, but I know they did at the time because I wrote a story called Lady Supreme and turned it in to, uh, to the image publisher. They sent it off to the Mike Diodato Studios and it came back and they didn't draw my story. And they said, okay, now rewrite your story to fit this art. <laughs> What? So it's a very famous uh, issue in my um, history, the, the Lady Supreme, number one. What in the world is it about? I don't know. Um, but no, it, when it comes to my work, I want, I'm looking right here because there's my folder for um, five years, number 10. So let me step off for just a second and I will show you what I did for the last issue of five years. Um, here's what happens, is I sit down and I start making... And a, that has a spill on it too. That's actually, <laughs> um, no, that's actually watercolor. Oh, okay. That's when I was making you a card and that's watercolor. Oh, card. 
Um, it's an I love you card. Um, so anyway, um, script page. I'm trying to get it so you can see it. So, you know, just page after page of writing out these scenes. And um, some of the scenes I don't even use, you know, like Yana, the uh, Russian lady in her apartment. Yana's neighbor is a government official police officer. He, sir, he invites Yana over for a drink, blah, 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 blah. I didn't even use that scene. Uh, Casey visits Francine in Hawaii, brings Russian surveillance with her. I didn't use that scene. You know, so what happens is I write out these scenarios in my idea, uh, my ideas, and um, then I, they're all in there, and I, I watch it in my head like versions, like different edits of a show. And then I figure out which ones worked better and which ones tighter. Because a lot of ideas just kind of wander off into a field and have a moment. What good did it do the final story? So you're kind of like a, a novelist in this aspect. You're, this is what uh, Arthur Quiller Couch meant when he said, or murder your babies. You have these favorite moments, but do they really work for the story? And you love that moment. You wrote it. You, you think it's clever, but it doesn't help the story. So get rid of it. Um, so that's, I mean, I write a ton of this stuff before I start. And then when I sit down at the paper, I know, okay, in this scene, Case uh, Zoe is driving a uh, car um, and she's being chased. And I know that it's gonna be chaos. And I know she's gonna hit a bump, come down nose first, crash the thing up the car. People are shooting through the back window. So when I sit, I know that much for the page. And then when I sit down at the page, I'm drawing, the, Zoe driving that car, and I'm drawing this Russian scientist in the seat next to her, telling her she's crazy. And then the dialogue just flows from me. Um, like if people, if we're at a, if there are four people at a dinner table and we're just talking and we're all in a good mood, um, my comebacks, I just can't stop it, you know? And it's like that when I'm writing for here. I, I just, I hear Zoe, I hear them batter back and forth, banter back and forth, and it just, comes you know um well you also had the luxury of being able to edit on the fly mm -hmm. where if you're working with the team you're really you have to stay in your own lane and you have the luxury of being able to change things up until the minute you send it to the printer exactly so i think you have more creative uh, control than most comic book people in the comic book industry who are working with the team. So I think over the years you've learned how to edit yourself um, to keep things down to a dull roar, so to speak. And you know, basically, this is how cartoonists traditionally work. They have an idea and then they sit down and flush it out. Whether it's a New Yorker cartoon or I'm just a long format cartoonist, basically. I sit down with an idea and I, I'm, my drawing is part of the writing. My, pro, my creative process is actually working on the paper at the time. And that's why we joke about I erase so much because I think of something better, erase better, erase better, and I just keep improving it until it's just deadline time. So yeah. And if you look at my originals, you'll see lots of um, paste over repairs using you know temporary labels taking them off, putting them on, improving, improve, improve, improve. Which would not happen if I was working with a team. I send it off and that was it. Yesterday was my last chance to improve it. So, you know, that kind of thing. I, I like the way I work, actually. Well, it works for you. It works for me. And I've, I've worked in team, team efforts before and that's fine. And you just do your best until it's time to turn it in, um, whatever your part is. So. Okay. I don't know, man. That you that asking for was real detail. Hot. That was really hot. And, <laughs> but he's asking for real show and tell too, yeah. which um, it's hard to do in this format. It's hard to do in this format. But I, I can give you a forensic view at a page that was made. Maybe I'll do that next week. Okay. Anything else? What are you drawing today? Today, um, back on the artist, uh, just looking at the art side. Uh, you know, I have ongoing characters, and a lot of people, you know, everybody does. 
How do you draw your character from, say, the same character from, say, age 12 to age 50? How do you try make a character? Once A lot of people spend a lot of time working really hard to get a character to look just right. Um, but then, what if you need to change that? And they're 20 years younger, they're 20 years older. Do you just start adding wrinkles? <laughs> what do you do, you know? Um, so I thought we'd take a look at that and how I aged my characters from both ends of the spectrum. So, Okay. All right. You guys have a good week, and I'll meet you back here next Sunday. Okay, meet me right here at the lab. Okay, our young lady. Um, everything uh, besides right in here, everything else is details. This hair is going to change a million times during life, so let's just leave the hair alone, okay? Um, it's not about the hair because that's just fashion. Whatever happens there. Let's just get it so you can see the hair there. Okay, I would say that this person is, what, 12 years old? Um, I don't think I've drawn too many characters that are much younger than like six. Uh, I've drawn infants and six-year-old, 12-year-olds in the stories that I've done. Um, that's the simplest cartooning version you can get. What you would, what happens as we get older is the skin on the face starts to wear from gravity. It also starts to stretch just from being used um, during our lifetime. And what can start off as, say, almond eyes, and eyebrows here. Something that don't change is the size of your eyeballs, um, the, the size of your skull after a certain period of time. So those are things you can leave alone. That's really close to the amount of detail I would use uh, for a young person in my comic. I don't really get much more detail than that in my drawing. I like to use a simpler uh, European style of cartooning for my art. So um, there. That's basically, let's, let's say Francine or Zoe. Okay, as Zoe hits her late teens, uh, these eyes will still keep their shape, the eyebrows like that. The nose will grow a little longer um, as the nose continues to grow throughout your lifetime. So I would start drawing the nose a little bit lower. It's not quite so short and uh, perky as it was. And by the time she's, say, 18, she's got the nose she's going to have um, in terms of length. Um, this will also affect a little bit on the mouth. And I would drop this jaw down a little bit as the jaw finishes growing. There. We just went from child to um, late teens, teenage years. I would use that for all of my teenage years. I'm going to get this eye prettier because it just looked like a blob. Okay, uh, not dealing with things like hairstyles and makeup changes and eyebrow uh, changes throughout the next 10 years, like from 19 to 29, um, would we'll just look at just honest aging. Uh, what will happen is as people smile more and laugh and all that, you begin to uh, create more um, corners on your eyes down in here. Um, a lot of sleepless nights through college years and teen years and all that, and you begin to have a little more depth in here. Um, and um, depending on your, how um, uh, flexible your skin is, your skin type and all that, whether or not you're starting to develop smile lines like that. Um, not everybody does uh, at an early age, or they may have, if you have a low body weight, body mass index, uh, you may start developing some lines out in here. Um, and I've noticed one th another thing, too, is that as people suffer more heartaches, the brightness in their eyes um, 
uh, isn't always so readily evident. It can, can always show up in their biggest, warmest smile, but the eyes tend to uh, drop just a little bit in enthusiasm as people age. And then they can turn it on when they want to, um, but, um, you know, a little uh, experience begins to show on the face. Okay, as that's happening, all this skin in here is very fragile and it begins to uh, get a little bit more uh, fat or collagen or something in there. That pushes down on the corners of the eyes. So the eyes begin to get lose a little bit of their almond look because the skin is starting to cover it. So you have the same eye but imagine that this is this area is becoming a little bit thicker. So it kind of takes the edge off that almond eye, which gave the young person a, uh, an enthusiastic look in their eyes. And now it's getting to be a little more worldly, like that. And definitely you would draw more uh, lines at the corner of the mouth when they're smiling or something like that. And Another thing that starts showing up in your 30s is a little more fullness down in here. Now what we had before, unless of course this person is jogging eight miles a day every day and, and eating vegan, but this uh, jawbone right here, you know there's that jawbone right there. The skin right around it, um, you have to have a super low BMI body mass index to keep the skin tight underneath there and up underneath the chin. That, that part right in there, um, that's very um, uh, tender skin and it, it is easy for it to fill out as the fat of the cheeks comes in, it also comes in right in there. So say this person has uh, a really bad year and stops exercising, this face will get a little fuller here, here, and then it'll also thicken out the neck. Nothing inside the neck changed. The bones, the tendons, the veins are all still right where they were, but it's all the skin and everything around it and the fat cells, they grow wider and wider. Um, so cut to 50, and if you haven't had any surgery, then what you're going to get is flatter tops on the eyes because of this. Flatter top on the eye. You still have the bottom where it was. I'm still trying to draw that same eye. I'm still trying to keep the same eyebrows, although those would have changed uh, just through as people's taste change. As they get older, they you do different things. And now you really do have those bags under your eyes and the smile line. These smile lines are earned. That's from happiness and um, all those fun times you had outdoors. Don't regret them. They're proof that you went somewhere and did something. Okay, so now you've got the, the older eyes. And the top lip changes. It actually collects more fat as well, and it pushes down a little bit. So people actually get longer top lips. It looks like, um, you know, it's not, didn't actually, I don't know if it really grows. That's, that's a doctor question, but... Um, the lips do tend to thin out a little bit. So now you've got that, and the chin is still right where you left it, but it has a lot more uh, padded skin around it. So you get, put some padding on the skin, round out the jowls, like that, and picture these jowls that goes all the way around under there. And that's where the actual, from the chin to the neck, that's the actual connection point. So on the side view over here, you what you would see is the chin padded, here's the neck, and that. And that is actually all of this, all of these part right in here is all connected. And this is the primary target when people want to go get um, surgery, um, you know, cosmetic surgery to look younger. They're trying to get rid of the what's naturally collects right there.
So, take all those terrible lines off there that make it look like a puppet. And there we have the older person. Now, it gets a little rougher from here. You, the weight of all this as it collects starts to show. And these actually become more uh, pronounced. Like that. That becomes more pronounced. You still have your eye, but there's a lot more skin around it. My hand shakes when I don't have my arm lying on my... Um, board. Okay, I was focusing right there on the nose. The, the nose, the cartilage, I don't think the cartilage grows, the cartilage stops right there, but the skin on the nose continues to grow. So the skin goes, this, this will continue to grow a little bit, and it actually changes the shape of the nose. So as you get older, your nose gets bigger, even for, for women like Francine. So that will get a little bit bigger. So when you're drawing it from the front, you have to account for that. One other thing that happens, though, is I think if a lot, a lot of people that I've known that have aged, they're grateful for their life and their experiences, and they're, gr they're grateful to be here. So the uh, smile actually gets warmer, I think, on like grandmothers seeing their grandkids and things like that. Pull that nose down a little more. I mean, the, the chin. And then just uh, go for the like that. Now, this is a person and there still has some tautness under the skin. You just get the double, the double chin. That's like 40 to 60. When you get over 60, this skin begins to, um, it begins to uh, stretch more. And that's when you start getting the, what they used to call the turkey neck of older people. And that's, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, like that. The ears get bigger, ears continue to grow, like that. And we didn't even talk about this, but yes, those lines up there. And there you kind of have it. There's that person through 80 years of life. And it all started with that young child. But you know what? This face is earned. That is a life well lived. And if you are fortunate enough to, to live a long, full life and, and collect all these souvenirs of happiness and grandchildren and uh, love and uh, great trips, things like that, this is, this is a good thing. Don't be afraid to draw seniors. <laughs>